Hey everyone, just having a little video today to answer one of the questions that was presented on the channel questionnaire, which by the way will be linked in the description of this video as well if you want to submit a question, or of course just dropping one of the comments I will also read and do my best to respond to in a video or a reply to that comment. Today's question from Selton, thank you very much, was modelling low poly to high poly in Blender in depth, and I'll be doing my best to answer that today. But before we rush right into things, there's been a couple of little misconceptions about what's going on with this channel. And I thought I'd just clear those up first. The first misconception I thought I'd clear up is that people seem to think me and Stanatech are the same person. While we did produce a course together, link in the description, we're definitely not. I'll give him a ring on Discord now to prove it. Why do people think that I'm you? <sighs> Sit down. No, answer me. Why do people think that I'm you? I think you know. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Why would anyone possibly confuse you with me? You got it? No. Say it. Because... Say it. Because we're the same person. There we go. <laughs> oh, I don't know what that was about. Some kind of strange dream. Anyway, me and Stella are definitely not the same person, but you should check out the course we've got up on Gumroad at the moment. Anyway, on to the second misconception. I got a question from a user simply going by Da. Now they ask interesting things about 3D modeling, but they say that I'm from the CIS, which after a brief bit of research is the Commonwealth independent states. Now, that isn't correct, and I also can't speak Russian, but uh, I'll tell you why the zebra is so special in another video. Although I think Google Translate might be the only one that wants to know that question, not Mr. Da. And my art station page will be in the description. Anyway, with all this out of the way, let's carry on and turn this low poly mesh into a high poly mesh. The first method we're going to look at is using a bevel. So I'm going to take this triangle off here that I had previously on this basic model, which will be available for download in the description, by the way. I'm just going to add the bevel modifier. Now, this adds more geometry around edges to create a smoother appearance across the entire model. And in certain situations, this can be enough to create high poly. So let's take the word high poly quite literally and increase the segment count to around four or five. There we go. We're already getting a somewhat better result, but there's definitely a few drawbacks of using bevels. First of all, the shading is not great. Let's just try shading smooth. I mean, see, it's all right, but in some places, unless the mesh is particularly perfect, we do get some errors. So we can just reduce the width to try and reduce these errors. But then we don't get as much control over how smooth we want these edges to be. But in certain situations, this would be enough for a high poly mesh. But as you can see, there are many other errors. Like for example, this comes around here at a very angular look because it doesn't actually increase the amount of segments going around, it just increases the edge bevels. So with that in mind, we're not going to use this one for probably most things, but under certain situations like say for example you just need a cube with bevels on it, I mean it's going to achieve that just perfectly without any kind of flaws whatsoever. But that's the bevel modifier, probably one of the weaker ways to turn a model into high poly. Let's try something else. So next we'll have a look using subdivision surface. Now this modifier essentially cuts faces into pieces to add more topology. So we just add that modifier on. Now, if I apply it, we can see what it's done. It's pretty much just smoothed over and cut up every face into some kind of higher resolution version, but without giving it any kind of controls, it just destroys the mesh. So there are two ways most commonly used to control subdivision. And one is by adding boundary loops like this near edges. And this means that when it's smoothed over, it will smooth them over for a smaller distance and it will hold the shape that you were using in the first place. So I'm going to add these on and then demonstrate. And you can see this holds the shape. Yeah, much better than it did before, but this isn't an ideal mesh. It's got some end guns and some other slightly awkward modeling things. And I did this on purpose because I wanted to show 
another method we can use. Of course, it's possible to get in here and really carefully use the knife tool, etc., to clean up these slightly more challenging pieces of topology as I'm doing here. Just drawing out edges where they previously weren't, but do need to be. And if we do this around the mesh, we'll actually get a pretty good subdivision result, more than likely. Just remembering to try and form things into quads, because subdivision generally will give you the most predictable results if you have things formed into quads like that. And you can see this improves the results we're getting, but in my opinion, there's a much easier way to deal with it, rather than having to go around and pick over everything with the knife tool and cut all these loops into it. We can just do something else. Let's go back to our original mesh before we subdivide it and cut it all up. So this time, let's have a look at using some holding edges, but via marking this time, not via the more effort-intensive topology method. Basically, all we're going to do is go along the edges we want to hold, like this long, sharp edge on the top here, and just type crease 1. And that, you can see, marks this edge purple. So we're just going to go around and choose every edge that we want to hold, the sharp edge basically, and just put them as one on the mean crease. That's a pretty straightforward activity, so I'm just going to speed up through this. Alright, now with all my edges marked, I can add the subdivision modifier again. And you can see it holds the shape pretty tightly. Oh, I missed one there. There we go. Now you can see it holds the shape pretty tightly to where all the edges are, but just smooths it around the shape. Now some things to watch out for. On the end guns I've included here, you can see we're getting an issue. Now I think if we view the wireframe of this situation, we can see that the end gun it's causing the topology to cut across and go inside. So we're just going to take the knife tool and we're just going to turn this end gone into two quads. Just like that. And now it's handling it perfectly fine. Let's do the same on the other side. We won't use the knife tool this time. We'll just select the two vertices and just press J to join to exactly the same effect. Nice. That cleaned it up. And the same on the bottom, actually. These are the kind of things you need to look out for when you're using end gone to subdivision. Looks like I'm going to do the same thing there. Thankfully, these uh, end guns are pretty easy to turn into quads in the situations where they've got wonky. But under certain situations, you may have to get particularly creative with the knife tool to just make the subdivision flow the way you want it to. And I can only include so much about this in this tutorial, but really you'll just have to get a feel for how subdivision likes to flow around a mesh, which I'm sure you will in. Uh, very little time if you keep using this method over and over. So I can turn off the wireframe now. And I can see that this method is pretty good. Uh, I can create the resolution around the circle to be nearly infinite. Well, not infinite, you know, but indefinite. And um, the only issue is that these holding edges are really hard. So we could actually be able to use a bevel modifier with this and bring it back to that. And you can see that, oh, you can see we have the subdivision issue here. So all I'm going to do is just draw across to this top one here. Some holding topology, there we go. Now it's just fine. And combining the bevel with the subdivision, when the subdivision is under control, we can actually get a pretty powerful result here for a high poly. It's smooth all the way around, and the edges are really smooth themselves too. So there's one other method, however. And we want to keep this general smoothness around the outside. The vicinity created by subdivision, but instead of a bevel, we can use a remesh. And all we need to do is type in here about 0.25, and you can see this essentially recreates the mesh using voxels, but we need to make sure it's amply low distance to uh, give us the right smoothing. And then once we've got this down to a low enough size voxel to smooth over, well, eh, that's not bad. Although I think a small bit higher would do well. 
we can add the weighted normal modifier, which smooths over the mesh quite nicely there. Now this isn't as optimal as bevels. You can see we get kind of tearing around the edges and stuff. It's not terrible, but um, it's good for some things. Like it, it will handle the end gone stuff on the corners really well. But as you can see, the result we get here of tearing is just not so good. We can try a smooth one, see if this gives us a better result. But again, we still kind of count kind of the same problems. We can use the modifier smooth to uh, go over it a little bit. Yeah, once once we add the smooth modifier, uh, the remesh can be pretty powerful. You can see you can't really see too much of the tearing on the corners anymore. We've got a really nice bevel. And the, the strength of the remesh is that it will handle pretty much like any really dodgy topology. Whereas the bevel will kind of kick up a fuss and complain at you for having things like the end gold sweeping under here. Like if I take these two away um, and I go back into object mode, you can see that we actually have a problem here where the end gone is pulling itself under the mesh. But the remesh is still completely fine with just coming over that and giving you a perfect result. So it's just the different tools for the job, how quick you want to get away with it. But the downside is, you know, the remesh will give you topology that looks like this, rather than the bevel, which will give you more traditional, normal topology you'd expect that would be significantly easier to work with. I'll just show you what the bevel topology would look like. That's interesting. You see the, the edge along here is kind of smoothed over for some reason. Yeah, let's go down to one and add the bevel. You can see the topology we get from this is significantly more workable for the um, edit mode stuff. Any kind of later edits you may need to make, any changes you may need to make. But it's uh, not as respondent to basically broken meshes <laughs> as the uh, remeshes. So it's about choosing one or the other, um, depending on the situation. So that's all the methods in Blender covered. I'll likely do another video at some point showing some stuff in ZBrush. But uh, one last note about this is very convenient. You have a low poly kind of pretty much ready for baking. If you use these methods where you turn a low poly into a high poly, they're already in the same position. You can see they're even Z fighting. This file, of course, is included in the description of the video. And with all that considered, we're done here today. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, stick around, and I'll hope you're producing more content in the future. This year, I aim to produce at least one video every single month, and I've got a lot of ideas written down and in pre-production. Thanks very much. See ya.